Yaakov says, Abuna, a question about the prayer robe. How should we pray the Kiri Alayson when using a prayer robe? Very good question, Yaakov. So the prayer robe, typically, we often use it. You can definitely use it for the Kiri Alayson. Kiri Alayson, for those who don't know, are the Greek words that the Coptic Church adopts. Uh, because if you, whether you know or you don't know, the Coptic and the Greek language are very, very, very similar. There's a lot of words that overlap. Kiri Alayson literally means, Lord, have mercy. So when you are requesting the Lord to have mercy, and as you pray the Kiri Alayson, uh, you can pray the prayer rope one at a time. So most prayer ropes, they will come in either batches of 33, 50, 100, sometimes even more. And you can get a spiritual rule from your father of confession, from your spiritual guide. And ask them how many times I should repeat it. Now, there are others who use the prayer rope for the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, there's, there's a shorter formula of that, which is Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Regardless of what it is that you are praying, just make sure that you are doing it diligently. Because there are some people who will take their prayer ropes and they'll, they won't really pray. They'll take their prayer rope, for instance, and what they will do is simply, you know, just say, what's the point? What's the point? Make sure that you're praying. Don't simply try to get through the prayer rope for the sake of getting through it. Take the time to pray it properly. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you are interested in knowing a little bit more about the prayer rope and the Jesus prayer specifically, we did do a video on the Jesus prayer, which takes the time to explain it and how and why we use that vocabulary. It also goes a little bit into, you know, the, the, the integrity that it takes to be able to pray it. I urge you, if you want to know more, you can go ahead and get it on there. Marina is asking, hi, Abuna, thanks so much for doing this. I'm wondering about a few things. Why did Christ have to die? Why death to fix our corrupt nature? Why did the inherent... Uh, now why do we inherit a corrupt inclination from Adam? So Marina, you're asking a lot of questions all at once, okay? <laughs> and they're very important questions because all of these questions tie into what the church calls soteriology, the definitions of how it is that we believe we are saved. If you have never read the book on the incarnation by St. Athanasius the Apostolic, I urge you to read it because he does a wonderful job of explaining why we needed a God who was willing to become man and why that God-man, that incarnate God, then had to be crucified. And then why the cross specifically, and what he did in his death to save us. He goes into it so beautifully. Long story short, and as quickly as possible so that we can have time for other questions. It was important for the Lord to come in the flesh and to die, specifically because the greatest of enemies was death. Death was conquering over us. In the liturgy of St. Basil, we speak about how it is that the Lord, he became man so that he can defeat death and this death which reigned over us, whereby we were bound and sold on account of our sins. Death was like this tyrant that needed to be defeated. And so how does God, who is light, who is infinite, come face to face with death? God cannot die. But if God were to become man, man can die. The human being can die. And this is why the incarnation is so important. God became man so he could do what we cannot. We could not defeat death. We didn't know how to live after death had taken over. But we needed God, who is life, to become like us. So while being God and being man, mysteriously, in our Christological belief, perfect God, perfect man, this person of Jesus Christ is now capable of dying on the cross because he has taken on flesh. And when he meets the great enemy, death, he captures it. He takes death. He destroys death. That's why the great anthem of the church during the 50 days of the glorious resurrection, what do we say? Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. So he became man and tasted death in the flesh for our sakes. Because as he participates in our death, he then takes it and is capable of destroying it. And he rises from the dead, giving us now hope for life even after death. I mean, I hope that answers your question. I know it was very quick. But I urge you, please, on the incarnation, to be a good read. There's a question that says, Father, Christ has risen. Can you explain? Indeed, he has risen. Can you explain to me the meaning of giving to God what is God's and the emperor what is the emperor's? Does it have to do with separating church and state? 
Very good question. Very, very good question. So here we're referring to the passage where the Lord is being tested by the Pharisees and they bring the Herodians with them. And as they bring the Herodians, they want to trip him up. They want to set him up so he can fail. And so they tell him, uh, oh, good teacher, we know that you always speak the truth and you have no biases and you don't, you don't really care for people's opinions. You only speak the truth. Why don't you tell us, should we go ahead and pay our tributes to the emperor? And they're really putting him on the spot because he can't answer anything that won't get him in trouble. If he says, yes, pay your taxes, the Jews will turn on him and they're like, what do you mean pay your taxes? Like they're, they're, they're tyrants. They exploit us. We can't even live because of them. We can't stand the empire that completely takes advantage of us. And so the Jews will turn on him. And if he says, no, don't pay your taxes, don't give anything to Caesar, then the Herodians will take that news back to the king of, uh, of Israel, who was Herod at that time, who will report it to the Roman Empire, and then they will consider him some sort of rebel who's trying to turn the people against the empire. He can't win. So the answer that the Lord Christ gives to them, and he says to them, why are you testing this? Why, why are you doing this? Why are you being foolish? He goes, give me a denarius, give me a coin. And so they give him a coin. And the same thing that we have until today, on all currencies, you always have pictures of those who once ruled the land. So on Canadian currency, you have the queen. And on American currency, you have all the past presidents. Um, you take, he takes one of these coins and he says, whose image is found on the coin? And so they all say Caesar's. He goes, excellent. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And render unto God what is God's. But what is he pointing at? How does he know what belongs to Caesar? He's hinting that whatever image is found on the object, give that object back to its owner. Because if the image is found on that object, it belongs to him. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And what is Caesar's? Those things that bear his image. But the question to you is when he says, render unto God what is God's, what bears the image of God? This is the lesson. The church fathers are actually, they write about this very beautifully. St. John Chrysostom has a lot to say on the subject. I urge you, go look up at the, com the commentary. He says he's enticing and moving the hearts of the people to say what? Who bears the image of God? According to the book of Genesis, according to Moses, and this is very clear to all the Jews who are listening, the human being bears the image and the likeness of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 makes it very clear. Let us create man in our image and our likeness. And so because the human, bear, the human being bears the image, he says, if this is the image of Caesar and all you're giving to him is metal, give him back his metal. But you belong to God. You bear the image of God. Offer yourself to him. And coincidentally, here we are speaking of giving ourselves to God. And today we're speaking of St. Anthony the Great, who is a great example of this. I hope that answers the question of the person who asked it. Very good question. Thank you for asking it. The question says, Father, can you explain why Catholics and Orthodox pray to venerate Mary and the saints? From an evangelical perspective, I can't seem to understand it. Thank you so much for asking that question, American Remains. Um, there's a beautiful video that Father, uh, Father Gabriel Wiese did on intercession that I urge you, if you have the chance, he goes into a lot more detail. Um, and I want you to consider it because what I'm going to give you right now is going to be a very quick answer. But he goes into a lot, a, a much more detail as to why we ask for the intercessions of the saints. So first, we have to come back to the understanding of the Catholic Church and uh, Orthodox Church that are apostolic churches um, that did not go through the Reformation in the 16th century, that traced their traditions all the way back to, you know, the apostolic age. Intercession and prayer and ecclesiology all come together in the question that you are asking. What do we believe about the church? We believe that the church is not only physically here on earth. We believe that the church truly is the body of Christ. And the body of the Christ is formed of all of its members. Those who are still here and those who have preceded us into entering into the kingdom. Which means the one holy church of God, his entire body, all of the members put together, are a combination of those that are in heaven and those that are still here hoping to be able to make it. So what does that mean? It means that the entire church comes together when we pray and ask for the salvation of the world. So let me say this differently. Today, you might have no problem coming to me and telling me, Father, let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. And you might hold my hand endearingly and in a tremendous amount of love and compassion. You might pray that the Lord bless me and watch over me and my family and that you might, you might want to ask the Lord to be able to fill me with his spirit. And you will do that out of love. What are you doing there? You're interceding for me. You're praying on my behalf for me out of love. 
Sh should I have the response then to tell you, what are you doing? No, I don't need anybody to speak on my behalf. I speak directly to Christ. Of course I speak directly to Christ. But we are one body. One body. To pray for one another is absolutely essential. But I guess my question to you is the following. If I am willing to allow you to pray for me, why would I not ask those who have preceded, those who are already in the presence of the Lord, to also pray for me? If I'm willing to turn to my, to my wife and to tell her, remember me, I have a big, I have a big talk to give tomorrow, I, I need grace, or to tell my children, don't forget to pray for me, I have a big day ahead of me. Those are all things that I have no problem doing, and I, I don't act as if somehow I can't go to Christ directly. Of course not. I'm involving those that I love in my salvation. I'm involving them in the way that I ask for God's mercy and his love. And I do the same with those who have preceded me. I do the same with you know, my grandfather who passed away. I ask him to remember me as he stands before the throne of God. I do the same with my intercessor, St. Anthony the Great. I tell him, remember me. In the same way that I hope to live up to, you know, the expectations of Christ, as you also have made it, pray for me that the same Holy Spirit that worked through you may also work through me. I do the same with the Mother of God, the Holy Virgin St. Mary. I tell her the same way that you interceded at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, and you asked your son to have mercy and to cover those that will be, would have been shamed had the wine run out, also ask your son to cover me, that I may not be ashamed when I stand before his holy throne. And so intercession in the mindset of the apostolic church is the, is the involvement of the entire body. All of us, all the members that form the body of Christ, that form the holy church, all of us coming together and praying for one another. I hope that answers your question, American Romans. And thank you so much for asking it. Nathan asks, I have a question on seeking truth. If I was born in another religion, Muslim, atheist, Protestant, how would I find the truth? Some say the truth is God, but we can, but how can we truly find God? I think it all begins with the pursuit of truth. You have to understand that nothing can happen unless you are actively looking for it. And there is a difference between I don't mind hearing about the truth and saying, no, I need to know the truth. One is aggressively pursuing the truth, knowing its value. It's an expression of how it is that I refuse to live a lie. That I am willing to do anything. As a matter of fact, I want to be honest with you and tell you that there was a period in my own life where I was so heavily involved in the pursuit of truth that I was willing to make the claim that if I found something to be the truth and it's not what I already had as a Christian, that I was willing to give it all up for the truth. And I pray that all of us have that same demeanor. That all of us are willing to say, I want the truth at all costs. And when I did the research, or when I invested myself in trying to find out the truth, all of those roads lead back to him who is the truth. Him who makes a declaration, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Everything points back to him. What's interesting is that while some people might not know it in the fullness, as it is revealed in the Christian tradition, there are those who pursue the truth so much that even though they don't get the beauty of the fullness of it, God still reveals himself in one way or another to them. And so when we ask the question, how do we pursue the truth? It begins with the sincere desire for truth. It begins with the desire of saying the truth above all else. And then eventually what we realize is the truth is not an ideology. Truth is not theory. Truth is a person. And when we come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, we discover that all glory, all worship is due to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to them be all glory forever. Because our God truly is the author and the originator of all that is true. It just has to begin with the pursuit of it. Jacob is asking, it seems Abuna he had the gift of discernment because it's hardly known when something like getting up to pray or fasting is from God or from Satan. I, Jacob, absolutely right. As a matter of fact, if you were to study the sayings of St. Anthony, St. Anthony makes it clear that the greatest virtue, it's funny, he, he, he doesn't say love, he doesn't say patience, he doesn't say humility, he says the greatest virtue is discernment because discernment is what allows me to know when to speak, how to speak, when to remain silent, if this is from God, if it is not from God, what is the source of everything that's happening around me? Discernment is something that we all need to be praying that the Holy Spirit 
reveals within us, that we build the muscle of discernment so that we can constantly be asking the Lord, is this from you? This is what the apostles meant when they referred to in scripture, bringing all thoughts into captivity before Christ. Every thought I have, I take it, imagine the image. You, I get a thought, I take it, I tie it to a chair, I grab it, I bring it before Christ and I say, is this from you? And if it is from God, perfect, I'll entertain it, I'll untie it, I'll work with it. But if it's not from him, I cast it out. I don't have time for it. And I move on with my day. So truly, Jacob, you're absolutely right. It is truly the greatest gift, discernment that Abba Anthony had. Observant Orthodox says, often praises from other people make it easier for us to be prideful. Should I ignore or reject them or how do I deal with these praises? Thank you for these live lectures, Father Anthony. Observant Orthodox, thank you for your question. This is such an important question. You're absolutely right. A great source of pride and a great source of attack on the ego is when we receive praises, when we think to ourselves that somehow we deserve to hear these wonderful things from our brothers and sisters. Oh, you did this beautifully. Oh, your voice is excellent. Oh, that lecture was great. Oh, that service was so compassionate. And we get filled up with pride. We get filled with pride. There is a beautiful story in the life of the Desert Fathers that talks about how it is that a disciple came to his Abba and he told him, I'm being filled with you know, pride because of everything that I am hearing. And the words of people have a great impact on me. And so his Abba wanted to teach him something. So he tells him, do me a favor, pick up a whole bunch of rocks from the floor and I want you to go to where we bury the dead monks. I want you to go to the burial ground. And I want you to throw rocks and curse the dead. Curse the dead and throw rocks at those that are buried. So the disciple out of obedience and being a good monk, he says, okay, doesn't question. It. So he goes, throws the rocks <laughs> at the tombs and he, he, he mocks them and he curses them. Oh, you're so dumb. You're so ugly. You're so foolish. You're so this. And he throws the rocks. And he comes back to his Abba and his Abba tells him, so what did they say? He says, nothing. They're dead. He's asking, go back and praise them. Tell them how wonderful they are and come back to me. So he goes out of obedience. He tells him, you're lovely. You're so wonderful. You're compassionate. You're humble. You're great. You're beautiful. You're godly. You're everything. He comes back. So, how did it go? There was nothing. He goes, what do you mean nothing? What did they say? They didn't say anything. They're dead. So he looks at his disciple and he goes, be like them. Neither respond to praises nor to criticism. Be dead to the voices of those around you. I believe that truly there is something to learn there. I'm not saying it's easy. Of course it's not easy. It's actually very difficult. But there is something there that we can learn. And we can learn from the fact that we are not to expect that our value or that what fuels our good deeds or our faithfulness is based on what people tell us. So observant Orthodox, I would encourage you. I would encourage you as I try to even encourage myself, don't listen to the praises. Give all glory to God. Whenever anybody tells you anything, say, thank God. Whenever anybody praises you and says that was beautiful, say glory to God. Redirect that praise. Redirect all of that glory back to our Lord. So, Abuna, how can we fight against impure thoughts? It begins by shooing them away. I want you to remember the image that we spoke about, about this whole idea of being baited, right? It might begin with a past image that you saw. It might be a memory. It might be something you're listening to. It might be you walking through the grocery store and at the cash, as you're paying, you see a magazine right up there that is so provocative, whatever it may be. Once you are baited, simply reject it. Reject it completely. Look at it and say, I'm not interested. Believe me, you have no idea how powerful lack of interest can be. Just simply do not entertain it. Do not feed the thought. Do not dwell on it. Do not pause that image in your mind and linger on it and meditate on it. Don't do that. Walk away from it. And then immediately turn to pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. First reject. And once you've rejected it, turn around and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on you. To fight thoughts is something that we are going to do constantly. Just don't give up. Because thoughts and these kind of like attacks from the devil are like a fly. You know, on a beautiful summer day, you're sitting outside, you're enjoying watermelon, you're having a lemonade, you might be drinking something else. I don't know what you're drinking, but whatever. You're enjoying the sun. And as you're sitting there, this pesky fly comes out of nowhere and it's like, 
and it's all over the place, and it lands in the front of you, shoot, and it comes back, and it lands on your shoulder, and you shoot away, and it comes back. It tries to land on your food, and you shoot it away, and it tries to come back. It's going to happen. The thought is constant. You're going to try to come back until eventually, eventually, like that fly, because you've done it seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve times, a hundred times over, then she gets tired and goes find someone else, and another one will come after it. We just have to be persistent. We have to be resilient. We can't give up. We need to focus on the fact that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to shoo away the thought, and I'm going to turn to the Lord and say, "Have mercy on me, sin." I hope that helps you, Kulis. Shalom Musi says, Abuna, are we in the end times? I don't know, Shalom. I'm not sure, my dear friend. I have to tell you, I don't think we are. My personal opinion is that I don't think so. But I will tell you this. If for any reason we are concerned, then why don't we do what scripture says and be watchful? Why not treat this as if it were the end times? And if it were the end times, the question is, have I repented? Have I reconciled with those that I am in conflict with? Have I sought, you know, the love and the grace of those around me? Have I honored my parents? Have I given to those that I can give to? Have I acquired virtue? Have I finished reading everything I could read in scripture and in the spiritual books to edify myself? Have I participated in the mysteries? Have I loved my neighbor? Have I loved my enemy? The question is, rather than trying to assess, you know, what we're seeing right now is it part of the apocalypse. Is this what we see in the prophecies? And, you know, are these two images fitting together? Don't worry about that. Just repent. Repent. This is what we're called to do daily. The beauty of the ascetic fathers and mothers of the desert is that they lived every day as if it was their last. So every night they went to bed thinking, I might not wake up tomorrow. So let me repent. And they woke up every morning saying, oh, well, I, I guess the Lord has granted me a new day. Let me live today for him because tomorrow, I don't know if I'm going to wake up. Every day was day one. Every day was day one. Here we are saying, oh my goodness, it's been three months that we're in lockdown, quarantine, day 94, day 95, day 96. I have no idea what day it is, by the way. I don't even know if we're in the 90s yet, but regardless. Um, to them, it was day one. Nobody's counting. Why? Day one is because today is a gift. Let me live it as if it was my last day. Because when I go to bed, I'm going to stand before the Lord. I don't think I'm going to wake up. And so they go to sleep thinking it's over. And when they wake up, they're like, oh, another beautiful gift from the Lord. Let me live today as if I was in his presence. Every day is day one. So I urge you, my dear beloved, Shalom Musi, my brother, I ask you, please, don't worry about these things. On the contrary, I would urge you just to focus on repentance and to act as if it was the last days. And if it is, the question is, am I ready?